has Emperor Palpatine been reading a copy of Machiavelli's The Prince? That's the question we'll consider on this episode of The Sci-Fi Show. people dislike the Star Wars prequel movies, I do think The Rise of the Emperor to Power makes an interesting study in the rise of tyranny and the exercise of dictatorial political power. Emperor Palpatine started life out as a senator and secret Sith Lord who through careful political machinations manages to depose the previous Chancellor of the Republic and have others choose him for the role. Later he sets other long-range plans into operation and has the Senate vote him emergency powers that he never gives up. The parallel to Hitler's rise to power are hard to miss here, but it also has parallels with the fall of the Roman Republic and the rise of the Roman Empire. Perhaps this is the way all attempts at democracy are fated to end, with a collapse into tyranny. <coughs> Niccolo Machiavelli was born in 1469 in the Italian city-state of Florence, where he worked as a diplomat during the exile of the ruling Medici family. Machiavelli lost his job and was jailed after the end of their exile, and he wrote his most famous work, The Prince, as part of an attempt to get back into favour with the ruling Medici clan. Machiavelli also wrote a number of other works, but for this episode, we'll concentrate on The Prince. The Prince is a manual on statecraft for dictatorial rulers. It aims to set out how such a ruler should govern, so as to govern successfully and avoid being overthrown. It's a brutally pragmatic manual that dispenses with any ethical concerns that might inform the actions of a ruler. One of the interesting innovations was its radical reimagining of the basic goal of government. The purpose of government that had been inherited from the ancient pagans and refined by the Christians saw the purpose of government as seeking to create an environment in which citizens could become more virtuous, to facilitate this proper end of man and not get in the way. Machiavelli would have none of this lofty idealism, and in The Prince recast the role of government as being limited to more ignoble ends. I'm sure you've heard it said, politics is the art of the possible. And this is an idea we get from Machiavelli, not from the older tradition. (coughs) Machiavelli was a child of his time, and the prince is his attempt at a political realism that sought to understand what really made for a successful ruler, as opposed to what people said was desirable in a ruler. Machiavelli's big idea was that of virtu and fortuna. These are the two forces that make up the scope of political life. Fortuna is what it sounds like, fortune or luck and it represents the forces in the world that are not in the control of a ruler, while virtu is not virtue as traditionally understood, but strength and power, and an indomitable will, not unlike Nietzsche's will to power. The goal of the ruler was to maximise virtu while minimising fortuna. One thing to note about this virtu and fortuna dynamic is that it means that Machiavelli's metaphysics is essentially atheistic. Machiavelli never explicitly came out and said he was an atheist. That would have been a very dangerous move in the culture of the time, but it's difficult to conclude otherwise from his basic metaphysical assumptions here. Any orthodox Christian or ancient pagan would never have reduced life to virtu and fortuna like Machiavelli did, and would have allowed for a third factor, that of divine providence. (coughs) Machiavelli would never have explicitly said a ruler should declare themselves an atheist, although it seems he would have counselled a practical atheism and attendant amoralism as a necessity for a successful ruler. Machiavelli counselled an external piety that any ruler should exhibit regardless of their actual beliefs. This seems similar to what we see politicians today who frequently rarely darken the door of a church or any other religious institution, except at election time, but always affirm whatever nominal piety is required of them. The practical amoralism that accompanies so much of Machiavelli's advice continues to flow from his basic metaphysical assumptions about the nature of man. Machiavelli, like Hobbes that would come after him, assumed that man was by nature essentially selfish and vicious. Given the nature of 15th century Florence, I suppose this is probably understandable. An event occurred during Machiavelli's life that is illustrative of the experiences that seem to have informed so much of his thinking. The Pizzi conspiracy, a pair of mutual murder plots that included members of the clergy, and ended with an attempted assassination in the city cathedral on Easter Sunday, during the Easter Sunday Mass. The two chief conspirators, one of whom was a bishop, suppose we can understand why Machiavelli developed the anthropology he did. (coughs) 
Machiavelli was one of those thinkers who people might publicly revile as despicable, but he's cast a long shadow on political thought even to this day. His counsel to rulers on promise-keeping would be familiar to most people in the West today. The advice was about what you'd expect. A ruler should keep his word in all cases where it's to his advantage and break it whenever it is to his advantage to do so. Much of Machiavelli's advice was like this, and he would have defended it by saying that he was just being a realist. He wasn't trying to be an ethical ruler, just a successful one. This again puts him at odds with those who went before him, who saw successful statecraft as intrinsically tied with the good. Machiavelli saw the two as at odds. Another event that coloured Machiavelli's view of the world was the events surrounding the Franciscan friar Savonarola. Savonarola came to Florence preaching repentance and humility, and for a time gained a hearing, and many in Florence were moved by his example and words. But in time the people wished to return to their lives of vice, but Savonarola was still there preaching virtue. The people of Florence sought to try to corrupt him or silence him, but they ultimately failed, and instead made Savonarola a martyr, burning him at the stake. Machiavelli later wrote that armed prophets succeed while unarmed ones fail. I think this is interesting, because the very culture Machiavelli was living in was built on the teachings of an unarmed prophet whose teachings overthrew the mightiest empire in history without the force of arms at all. This leads to another interesting thing about Machiavelli's metaphysics. He clearly sees bodily survival as the highest good. He says as much when working out his dismal view of man, observing that the reason people are basically selfish and vicious is because they prefer bodily survival over virtuous living that most people do not want to end up like Savonarola and will compromise principles to do so. This clashes again with the more ancient understanding that it is better to suffer evil in the body than to take evil into your soul by participating in it. What do you think of this idea? Is it better to suffer at the hands of an evil person, or avoid that suffering by participating in the infliction of it? Is the Emperor following Machiavelli's playbook? It seems that in many ways he is. He rises to power through manipulation of those who stand in his way. It doesn't hurt that the amiable and innocent-looking minor senator Palpatine from Naboo is also the ruthless and powerful Sith Lord Darth Sidious. We see Palpatine playing both sides against each other and engineering the very crisis he steps in to save the Galactic Republic from. He uses the Jedi and distracts them by using them as generals in his war with the Separatists and then turning on and destroying them as soon as they becomes possible to do so, so that they will no longer be a threat to his power. Emperor Palpatine has an interesting solution to a problem Machiavelli saw. Nobody wants to die in service to his country, but people will vigorously defend their home against foreign aggression. Machiavelli spends some time counselling against the hiring of mercenaries when soldiers are needed because they inevitably fight only for a paycheck and are fickle and unreliable as a result. They may risk death for a paycheck, but they'll not face its certainty for one. On the other hand... Fighting gets people killed and rulers can be resented for sending sons and fathers to die. Palpatine solves this problem handily with his clone army of expendable but skilled soldiers obedient to him. What more could you want? Nobody at home has to get killed or maimed in war, but you have an army that will fight and die in your service without question. I wonder what Machiavelli would have made of such an innovation. There is another turn that takes place as the Galactic Republic gives way to the Galactic Empire. It's the increase in the number of soldiers necessary to police this new empire. The various sorts of armoured Imperial troopers are the ubiquitous bad guy in the later movies, enforcing the Emperor's will in all the worlds under his jurisdiction at the point of a blaster rifle. This turn is also found in Machiavelli, who counsels that a good state requires soldiers to enforce the dictates of the ruler. This need flows directly from Machiavelli's metaphysical assumptions about human nature. Machiavelli's assumption that humans are corrupt and selfish, that they're basically bad, means that because humans lack an effective conscience, laws will need to be enforced externally. If you remember back a few episodes when we touched on the idea of how morality may be learned, we had the modern Rousseau who thought humans were basically good, and we had Machiavelli and the writer deeply influenced by him, Thomas Hobbes, who both thought that virtue, by which they meant behaviour conducive to civic order, was something that needed to be beaten into people against their baser nature. Shouldn't be surprising with such an anthropology that lots of troops will be required to maintain order. The Emperor, in enthroning himself as head of the Galactic Empire, employs many of Machiavelli's ideas and strategies for maintaining order and securing his power base. Do you agree with Palpatine and Machiavelli that the successful ruler 
must forsake virtue to secure his rule? Or were the ancients right, and that successful statecraft and virtue go together? You can find more information on the different ideas contained in this episode in the show notes on scifishow.com. If you've never read The Prince, it's a short work that is worth your time. You'll be surprised how often you can see aspects of it represented even in our democratic rules of today. I can be reached with comments via feedback at scifishow.com. You can leave a comment in the show notes at scifishow.com and you can leave comments on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash scifishow. You can also follow the show via The Sci-Fi Show on Twitter. If you do enjoy the show, please go over to our Facebook page and click like. If there's a topic you'd like me to look into, please don't hesitate to ask. And don't forget, it's fine with a PH. Let me know what you think. The Sci-Fi Show is recorded under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Like 3.0 license and the music is by Furious J and Maniacal M. The Sci-Fi Show is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, interface Christianity with the world, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.